Much has been made in recent times of studio interference, when money-driven fat cats decide to start meddling with a given movie project despite never having been in spitting distance of a film camera. But what about flicks that actually got better because of studio interference? It might be a difficult thing to stomach, but sometimes these multi-million dollar studios do know what's best for a given movie project. There are several rare cases where studio meddling has resulted in a better film. So with that in mind and spoilers ahead, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with 10 movies that actually benefited from studio interference. Number 10, Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko was a critical and cult hit at the time of its release and set a growing number of cinephiles on course for a lifelong love affair with auteur film. The abstract plot, labyrinthian story and dense philosophical atmosphere led to a strong word of mouth promotion that only increased the film's popularity post-release. In order to eke out as much monetary return as possible, the studio moved forward with a director's cut, a version closer to director Richard Kelly's original vision and to put it kindly, this cut was a hot mess. Clocking in a whopping 20 minutes longer than the theatrical cut, much of the abstract elements have simply disappeared from the story. There are whole segments of the new cut that depict pages of The Philosophy of Time Travel, a book Donnie's reading, up on the screen for audiences to scrutinise. This in turn explains too much of what is going on. Much of the original film's charm was how much was left up to audiences to interpret, as well as rewarding repeat viewings. A further and yet more controversial change saw the opening needle drop of Echo and the Bunny Men's Killing Moon replaced by Love Will Tear Us Apart, both absolute bangers to be sure, but still very unnecessary from a tonal perspective. When Kelly's sophomore effort Southland Tales also bombed for the same reasons, it became clear that this was a creative error consistent with the director's oversight. In a twist worthy of Frank the Rabbit himself, the studio-mandated cuts were one of the main driving forces of Donnie Darko's original success. Number 9. American Graffiti George Lucas Whilst he's known well nowadays for some pretty wacky movie choices, his early effort, American Graffiti, was a relatively straightforward affair. A coming-of-age comedy inspired by the rock and roll cruising culture of Lucas's teenage years, the ensemble cast included future heavyweights like Richard Dreyfuss, Ron Howard and Harrison Ford as a group of high school graduates spending one final night cruising the Modesto Strip. The ending is bittersweet, revealing that two of our four main lead characters would go on to be killed in car crashes or the Vietnam War, whilst lead character Kurt never actually achieves a meet-cute between himself and a mysterious character only referred to as the Blonde. This is despite desperately seeking her out for most of the film, even going as far as to get a local radio DJ to broadcast his romantic overtures. In a frankly bonkers twist, Lucas originally wanted the Blonde to turn completely transparent, car and all, near the end of the film, revealing her to be a ghost the whole time, or a hallucination, who knows, it was the 60s. Up until this point in the plot, the blonde had been a mysterious but completely grounded character, making this reveal all the more unusual. Universal Pictures firmly nipped this idea in the bud, however, citing budgetary reasons. Had Lucas got his way, there's a possibility the cultural impact of the movie would have been lessened. Given that Universal was the only studio willing to take a risk on the young director at the time, Georgie Boy towed the line. It's not like he wouldn't have another opportunity to realise some of his more eccentric ideas elsewhere. Number 8. American History X American History X tells the harrowing story of racial violence, neo-Nazism and ultimately attempted redemption. After Edward Norton's violently racist Derek brutally kills a young black man in the street, his younger brother Danny, played by Edward Furlong, looks to be following in his siblings' prejudiced footsteps. That is, until Derek befriends an African-American man named Lamont and eventually manages to overcome his racist outlook. Hoping to save his younger brother from the same fate, Derek implores Danny not to become involved with his old gang, the DOC. The future for the main characters looks somewhat hopeful until young Danny is gunned down at school by fellow African-American schoolmates. In the original ending, this drives Derek back to his violent neo-Nazi ways and even implies he will always be this way under the surface. Very grim. In a mutinous collaboration between star and studio against director Tony Kaye, Edward Norton himself was sent into the editing room to tidy up the film. This re-edited ending still had Danny die at the hands of his school friends, but now we see Derek cradling his brother's body, inconsolable at the idea that it was Derek's own previous views that led to Danny's fate. What we got was a deeply tragic but ultimately satisfying movie experience that didn't overdo the sadness of the situation in the name of giving us a downer ending for the sake of it. Norton Norton's ending, vis-a-vis -vis the, the studio's interference, arguably saved this classic flick. Number 7. The Matrix 
The Matrix quite simply redefined action cinema at the time of its release. It threw sci-fi action, kung fu, fantasy, religion, philosophy, and computer programming, all of these things, at the wall and somehow made the whole affair stick like a perfectly cooked bit of pasta. The legacy of the Matrix franchise is so firmly established it needs no introduction. One of the many heady concepts thrown at us is the idea of humans being used as biological batteries to power the machine's techno-hell empire. Despite blowing many a tiny child's mind back in 1999, it's fairly common knowledge that this wouldn't work, violating most laws of basic thermodynamics. Even so, the Wachowskis showed off how intelligent they are by revealing in the DVD commentary that captive humans of the Matrix were originally enslaved as a neural network, being used for processing power rather than electrical power. The higher-ups at Warner Brothers thought that this was an innovation too far, however, getting the Wachowskis to change it to something more comprehensible, i.e. humans as batteries. Why did this improve the film? As stated before, many young moviegoers had a real revelatory moment the first time they watched The Matrix. If the film had been too complicated for the younger audience to understand, it simply wouldn't have had the same impact. Number 6. Casablanca Casablanca is such a hardcore classic movie that if you looked up classic in the dictionary you'd probably see Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman staring back at you. The film tells the timeless tale of world-weary expatriate Rick Blaine being forced to choose between the love of a married woman or doing the right thing, all set against the backdrop of a Vichy-controlled Casablanca. The iconic ending sees Blaine do the unromantic right thing by packing Bergman's Lisa Lund on a plane to safety with her equally endangered husband, Victor Laszlo. Pointing out she'll regret staying behind, saying, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. And having just uttered the most beautiful sentence in the history of cinema, Blaine walks off into the proverbial sunset, a reinvigorated man with new friends and a hopeful sense of purpose. This might not have always been the case, however. Casablanca is actually based on an unproduced play called Everyone Comes to Ricks. In a rare case of an adaptation, many people agree the film is a far superior piece of work compared to the play, which saw Rick Blaine as a weak-willed, wet flannel of a man and Bergman's noble Lisa Lund reduced to a one-dimensional, amoral caricature of a woman called Lois. In the end, Lois does indeed fly off with her husband, at Rick's behest, but this time poor Rick is arrested and carted off to an unknown but surely awful fate. It's a downer ending if ever there was one, and had it been translated to the big screen, there is no doubt Casablanca would not have had the staying power it's enjoyed these past eight decades. It should be pointed out that the genesis of this plot change came primarily from the writers, but without the studio encouraging such a rewrite, we simply wouldn't have gotten our victorious, if bittersweet, ending. Number 5. The Shawshank Redemption Another classic that requires little introduction, Frank Darabont's epic decade-spanning prison drama sees Andy Dufresne wrongfully imprisoned for the murder of his wife and lover. Experiencing horrific conditions, CD exploitation, and the possibility of dying behind bars, Dufresne makes a daring escape by tunneling his way out of his cell over the course of many years. This triumphant escape sequence, narrated by Morgan Freeman as prison bestie Red, is followed by a slow denouement as Red tries to adjust to normal life outside the walls of Shawshank. Remembering a promise made by old Andy, Red embarks on the world's most idyllic treasure hunt, finding money and directions to a remote Mexican coastal town where his long-lost friend might reside. Red hops on a bus to Mexico, and that's where the movie was supposed to end. Hoping to preserve some sense of ambiguity, Darabont's original vision saw the film close on Freeman taking the bus south, a monologue stating, I hope I make it to the border, I hope I find my friend and shake his hand. This ending firmly planted a giant question mark at the film's conclusion, and surprising no one, went down poorly with test audiences. Based on this, Castle Rock Entertainment compelled the director to tack on Red and Andy's joyous reunion on a Mexican beach, and although it seems rather implausible and overly saccharine when measured up to the film that preceded it, it nonetheless gives us the crowd-pleasing conclusion we all wanted deep down. Sometimes the good guys just need to win. Number 4. Dread Alex Garland's blistering adaptation of the comic book Lawman saw a perfectly realised Judge Dredd fight his way up 200 floors of utter sci-fi madness, a rookie partner in tow. The world and their mum agree this was an excellent action flick that did so much justice to the comic book source material. Hey, studio, why no sequel? 
From the egoless performance of Carl Urban to Lena Headey's skin-crawling villain Mama, the drugs, the gore and the action, there's very little to fault with this 2012 B-movie masterpiece. If behind-the-scenes stories are to be believed though, we were originally in for a much more cerebral, action-less experience. In 2011, the LA Times reported that due to creative disagreements between director Pete Travis and the studio, Travis was locked out of the editing room and banned from participating in the process. Instead, in an incredibly unusual move, writer Alex Garland himself was thrown into the editing room and told to make it better, presumably ramping up the action. And who can argue with the results? To this day, Dread charts highly in lists of comic book film adaptations and still raises the rose-tinted spectacles for nerds the world over. Pete Travis's version? We dread to think. <laughs> Get it? What's more, this successful stint as film editor likely contributed to Garland's decision to helm his own movies, so without studio meddling, we likely wouldn't have gotten Ex Machina a couple of years later. Number 3. Toy Story Pixar's seminal debut wasn't just their first feature-length production, but also the first computer-animated film ever. Recounting a heartwarming story of sentient toys discovering the meaning of friendship and collaboration, Cowboy Woody strives to keep his owner Andy happy and the toys that look up to him safe. Given the massive lead times involved with computer animation, Toy Story first had to be sketched and premised from so-called reels, rough 2D storyboards of a handful of scenes. Enter the infamous Black Friday reel. Born from the demands of then-Disney chairman Jeff Katzenberg to make the movie more adult and cynical, the overall tone of the reel was utterly bleak. Woody was no longer a flawed but good-hearted leader. Now he was a totalitarian douche canoe treating his plastic subjects very harshly for virtually no reason. One scene even sees him callously shoving Buzz Lightyear out of a window and then shrugging it off by saying, it's a toy eat toy world. Director John Lasseter recalled the first screening of the Black Friday reel with a sense of embarrassment and unhappiness. Roy E. Disney himself, among other studio executives, was so disgusted by the reel they almost shut down production entirely. Pixar successfully lobbied for two weeks to tweak and revise the concept, an allowance they were only given on the condition that Woody's character be softened immensely. Not that this mandated change improved Toy Story, it simply guaranteed that it would someday exist. And for that, we can be grateful to the House of Mouse. Number 2. Get Out Jordan Peele's racially charged horror masterpiece sees Daniel Kaluuya's Chris trapped by his girlfriend's reprehensible family and nearly locked away in his own mind forever, with no control of his body. As we all know, the film ends on one of recent cinema's best fake-outs, as we see Chris stumbling away from his gruesome fate, the flashing lights of a police car can be seen approaching. Chris's heart, along with the audience's, begins to sink. We're all painfully aware of how a young black man will be treated at a scene of violence, regardless of the perpetrators. Seemingly resigned to a fate not much better than his last, Chris appears to give up, only for Peel to pull the rug out in glorious fashion and reveal it was Chris's best friend Rod in his TSA car coming to the rescue. Backslaps all around! It is common knowledge that Peel's original ending saw Chris arrested and placed behind bars for the rest of his life, a bleak statement on the realities of the US prison system and how it affects primarily African American people. Whilst the studio didn't force Peel to change the ending, in fact he thought it was too bleak even for his own sensibilities, they did front the money to reshoot the conclusion to the one we got. This is no small feat as extended shooting after the fact is a very expensive way to live your life, but thanks to Blumhouse's insistence it would be worth the investment. We got the ending that satisfied us all immensely. Number 1. Lord of the Rings the Lord of the Rings trilogy is commonly regarded as one of the most awe-inspiring, influential works ever put to celluloid. The most ambitious movie production of its time, it's difficult to imagine Frodo and the Fellowship's epic journey being a nanosecond short of its original three-movie, 558-minute runtime. But the journey from niche fantasy book to multiple Oscar-winning adaptation was fraught with many potential cuts and compromises. One studio that got dangerously close to handling Peter Jackson's fantasy blockbuster was Miramax Films, who promptly stipulated the three books be cut down to only two movies. Proving that they weren't beyond further backstabbing, a certain Hollywood mega-creep, who shall not be spoken of here, tried to reduce the length again into only a single two-hour movie. Peter Jackson, seemingly knackered from Hollywood BS at this point, stood his ground on a two-film production. You Know Who eventually put the whole project on turnaround, essentially scuppering any other studios who might have wanted a go at making the films. Enter New Line Cinema, the saviours of this part of the tale. 
When Jackson pitched his idea to Bob Shea, even under the onerous conditions of Miramax's turnaround, he accepted the project under one condition, that the films be a trilogy. In a rare case of a studio asking for more of their money to be spent, New Line's stipulation made sure that not only would the films get the green light, but Jackson would be able to realise his original long-form vision. The Lord of the Rings trilogy remains one of the highest grossing franchises in the history of cinema, a rare unicorn of a film that pleased casual audiences, fans of the books, and movie critics all at once. It won 17 of its 30 Oscar nominations and spun off numerous other films and multimedia into a lucrative behemoth of intellectual property. Without New Line Cinema's initial meddling, it never would have happened. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day and I'll see you real soon.